Let's talk a little bit about luck. I've been trying to get lucky all my life. Okay, that didn't come out right. <laughs> I've been very intimate with luck all my life. And today I'm going to share with you an instrument that I believe that can help you control your luck. I assure you that when this video is over, you're going to think about at least five people that you're going to go share this on their walls right away because you're going to relate to what I went through in my life. Now, why did I get intimate with luck? Well, it has to do with this flag on my hand. This is the flag from a country called Guyana. Guyana is what I like to call a pothole on the planet. Not a great place to be born in. Not a lot of great things come out of it. Some good stuff, but nothing great. When you're born in Guyana, you don't have a lot of choice. You have to be a dreamer in order to get out. If you don't have dreams, you're just stuck there. I happen to be a really, really big dreamer, and that's because I had two parents who both were school teachers, which means I grew up with books. No toys, no games, no sports, just books. You guys have heard of students, yeah? You've heard of A students? You've heard of nerds? Have you ever heard of B nerds? I was a B nerd on the social stack below nerds. <laughs> but I had incredible dreams. And I read books all the time, and I just dreamed over and over about what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to be Michael Jackson. I mean, I wanted to be so many different things. And people would say to me all the time, every time I tell my aunts and my grandfather, what do you want to be, right? Just do well in school. That's all it was. And I was really good at school. A's are my thing. So I was like, I got that, but what do I need to do more? Now I'll just do well in school, you'll be fine. No one even said work hard. One day I decided I wanted to be the president of Guyana. I was probably about eight years old. I said it to my grandfather. And I remember this piece of advice from him very clearly because it's the only time anyone's ever said this to me. He said, you're going to need a little luck. And I go, what is this luck you speak of? No, I didn't say it like that. And so I set out in my first office, which looks like this. This is the home that I grew out in, eight years old, to figure out how to get lucky. And apparently, grades were one of the things, and I was always good at grades, but I had to get out of the circumstances that I was in. I'll talk to you a little bit about the circumstances. This is how you move from one village to another in Guyana. You put your camp on top of a cart, you put two donkeys in front of it, and you move to the next village. What are the odds of me being here today, being born with those odds? I'd figure one in none, but the mathematicians in the room would say that's a little bit not right, right? So one in a billion. By 10, I was really good at school. I figure maybe one in 100 million. By 20, I graduated college somehow. A's, no surprise there, right? Maybe one in 10 million. By 30, I'd started companies and sold it. I'd been written about. Uh, uh, I'd written patents. Well, then maybe, you know, one in a million is uh, like if you buy 20 bucks of a lotto ticket. Those are your chances. Somewhere the other I'm here. Got on magazine covers, published books, long list of things that I won't bore you with. But I got here by studying this thing called luck. I've been very intimate with it, and I'm going to share this instrument with you of how to control it, and I'll have to take you through the journey of how I found it. I study problems very deeply. So I started to look around for what do we know about luck. I'll tell you guys right now, as a civilization, we don't know crap about luck. We still believe 13 is an unlucky number and 7 is a lucky number. Think about that. That's about the best science we have. We don't even understand the luck of the Irish. Most people think Irish people are lucky. The luck of the Irish is actually how to deal with bad luck and the positive attitude that you have of it, right? I didn't figure it out until like my seventh St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> I studied probability quite a bit. How do I get out? I'm really good at grades. How do I get out? If I gave you guys a coin right now and asked you to flip it and you get heads, and then I asked you to flip it nine more times and you get heads nine times in a row, and then I say, okay, somewhere or the other I convince you, maybe I pay you. Flip it 40 more times, and you get heads 50 times. Most people will believe that the likelihood of getting tails on the 51st flip is high. It's not. 
it's still 50-50. Not only do we not understand luck, we don't understand probability. The only thing we know is that some luck you can control and some luck you can't. I love numbers. I can explain the entire world in 80-20. I think you can control 80% of the luck and 20% you can't. And I'll tell you how to control that 80%. And you're going to find those five people and you're going to go, I can't believe we've got to help those people. The first thing is luck has two sides. When you think about luck, you start to think about good luck, but nobody ever thinks about bad luck. How many people here have seen the movie The Bronx Tale? Raise your hands. Okay, good. You remember Eddie Mush in The Bronx Tale? Yeah? I want you guys to finish this sentence for me. If it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. When you start to study luck intimately, you recognize that in order to understand how to control it, you have to look at good and bad. If you just look at the good only, you miss the entire other side and you don't know how to control it for yourself. The second thing that I learned, and this I learned from my teenage years with my mom. My mom used to call me the what happened now son. I had amazing grades, I was in scholarships all over the place, but every time she got a phone call, it was, what happened now? (laughs) Crashed cars, got into trouble, I mean, anything you could imagine. And I discovered during my teenage years that when good luck occurred, I felt like I created it. But when bad luck occurred to me, I always felt like it happened to me. And it took a while in my parenting of my, of my mom, for me to realize that no, you create that stuff on yourself. That was my first lesson. Again, intimate with luck, trying to beat the odds, getting out of that office that I showed you guys. The next thing I learned was that good luck, in order to get it, it equals risk and effort. I read a lot, it was like opportunity and preparation and all this type of stuff. Well, no, that's the 20% that we don't control. The 80% that you control is risk and effort. I know a lot of people who take risks, but don't add effort to it. You guys know a lot of these people as well. There are people who start stuff all the time and it never goes anywhere. You know people like that? I know a lot of people who put a lot of effort, but don't get lucky because they don't take risks. Good luck is risk and effort. And so I focused on good luck quite a bit. I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. I got through my career and started to deliver some pretty amazing stuff. But I kept getting in trouble. I kept making a lot of money one year and losing it all the next year. I kept getting written up in magazines for good things and written up on the blotter for bad things. It took some time for me to realize that I was addicted to risk. Remember, to create luck, you have to take risk, right? Good luck equals risk plus effort. A lot of people are addicted to risk. Risk is actually an addictable thing. It creates the same type of neurotransmitters in your brain as cocaine. A lot of people ruin their lives because they're addicted to alcohol. A lot of people ruin their lives because they're addicted to cocaine. A lot of people ruin their lives because they're addicted to risk. But we never diagnosed them. I struggled with this quite a bit. I kept going all the way to the right going all the way to the left. It felt like the further I went to the right, the further I'd have to go to the left. You guys probably know this in your lives. Do you ever feel like when something good happens to you, something bad must be coming? Yeah? Or do you know people like that? As soon as something good happens to them, something bad must be following you? Good luck seems to lead to bad luck. And I couldn't understand it. I thought it was just me. Maybe these are just my odds. So I started to look around. I started to ask people. Everybody said, yeah, it kind of feels like that, but we didn't know exactly what was going on behind the scenes. Here's Bill Clinton, risk and effort to become president. Here's Martha Stewart, risk and effort to become one of the most successful businesswomen in the world. Don't say that when Oprah's in the room. Okay, here's Tiger Woods, right? One of the most successful golfers, risk and effort on the good luck side. Here's Bill Clinton explaining Monica Lewinsky. Here's Martha Stewart, explaining insider trading. Here's Tiger Woods explaining what I will just call shenanigans. (laughs) We're not going to get into it. It seems like because you take the risk on one side to create good fortune in your life, and risk is an addiction, 
You can't help yourself but take risk on the other side. You can't control the left side. That's how addiction works. On the right side, it feels like you're climbing a hill. I can control how hard I work. I can control how much I invest. I can control how much risk I take on the right side. On the left side, it feels like you're slipping down a slippery slope. You don't even know you're doing it. Anyone here ever did anything stupid? Okay, if you have not done anything stupid ever and you're sitting next to your spouse, ask your spouse. Spouses are really good at reminding you about stupid things that you did. And 24 hours after, your reaction is always like, what was I thinking? About a week or four weeks after, you start to go, that wasn't even me. And about three months after, you say to your loved one, I just had a little bad luck. But in the moment, you can't control it. No one can stop you from that slippery slope. That's the addiction of risk. There is no kill switch. There's absolutely no kill switch for it. I'm going to share with you an instrument that I call a kill switch that takes you through it. Even Dilbert feels that way. It's like you can't, you know, you just can't turn off awesome. So I had about two years of my life where I kind of lived taking no risks whatsoever. I had a nine to five job. It was very unusual for me. I took no risks to create good luck, but I didn't create any bad luck for myself either. So I I basically gave up. I figured there's no kill switch. I'm just going to do this. Interesting thing happened about these during these two years of my life. No one called me arrogant. And I started to think about that. What is it about risk that I just don't understand? How can I figure out a way to catch myself from that slippery slope? How can I get back to the stuff that I love to do, which is to take risk and add effort and make awesome sauce and just not screw it up with the bad luck that seems to be an automatic thing? I just didn't understand invincibility and ambition. And I got to this by getting some good advice from one of my ex-girlfriends. And I'll tell you guys right now, you get some of the best advice you can get from the people that love you. And I'll tell you how to look out for the advice when it's coming. Here's how you know when you're about to get really good advice from someone that loves you. It starts with the following phrase. You know what your problem is? (laughs) When you hear that phrase, my friends, when you hear, you know what your problem is? You're about to get the best advice in your life. She loved my ambition. She absolutely hated the fact that I thought I was invincible. She said to me in one of my meltdowns, do you know what your problem is? You think you're invincible. And it was that point that I realized that I can categorize the risk that I take on the right side and the risk that I take on the left side, and all I had to do was figure out a kill switch in between. You see, when you take risk on the right side, you're feeding your ambition. When you take risk on the left side, you think you're invincible. That was the dichotomy of the addiction that allowed me to get back to where I am today and beat the odds and get on this stage. I had learned how to create just good luck without self-destructing with what seems like an automatic tax that I have to pay on the left side of that circle. I'd learn how to do this, completely take it out. I could forget about the Bronx Dale. My favorite number in the world is threes. There's a three-step process. Okay, the kill switch comes with three things that you have to think about. I'll talk you through them. Why do I like threes? Well, all good things come in threes. Three stooges, three wise men, three little pigs. Yeah, see? Maybe three is a lucky number, not seven. We don't know squat about it. Here's how I started to catch myself about two and a half, three years ago, and it's been the best discovery I've ever made. And I can't wait for, to walk you guys through this because I think there are tons of people that live with a risk addiction and they can get through this. The first thing I do is when I take risk, I've learned that the risk on the right side that creates good luck requires effort. The risk on the left side requires no effort. I'll use an example to walk you guys through this. On the right side, let's say we're starting a company. It requires risk, it takes effort. On the left side, running a stoplight. 
Requires risk, zero effort. That's how I started to catch them. The second one, on the right side, when you're creating good luck, the likelihood of failure is high and the likelihood of success is low. We'll use the same examples. Starting a company, likelihood of failure, really high. Likelihood of success, really low. Running a stoplight, likelihood of failure, I mean, when you get caught and you get the ticket, it feels really bad, but think about how many times you ran stoplights before, right? The likelihood of failure is very low on that side. The last thing that I use to catch myself is when I look at my risks, I understand my addiction, and I go, okay, if I succeed, who benefits? The risk on the right, when you succeed, someone else benefits other than yourself, your employees, your family, your neighbors, your community. When you take the risk on the left and you succeed, you're the only person that benefits. This is what I call the kill switch for luck. This is how I've gone about controlling it. And the only way I was able to do it is because I got behind the scenes of trying to beat some terrible odds and studied the problem very deeply to figure out where I was. Bill Clinton, high risk, no effort. There's a joke in there somewhere, <laughs> right? Martha Stewart, insider trading, likelihood of failure, very low. She's Martha Stewart, for heaven's sake. Mr. Shenanigans. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a discovery that I landed on accidentally. It has helped me tremendously. And for anyone that you know that has an addiction to risk, I hope that you share this with them. And I hope that you can help them catch themselves when they're on the slippery slope. Because I can tell you, as a recovering risk addict, no one could have stopped me while I was slipping. Thank you very much.